Uh, Mr. President, I'm sure you've heard about this Supreme Court ruling um, concerning the controversy over whether or not the deputy speakers can vote. What do you make of the decision so far? Um, let me begin, first of all, by saying that um, as a rule, I've made it a point since I became president as much as possible not to comment on constitutional issues in the country. Uh, and people who are students of our constitutional law, our constitutional jurisprudence, are very much aware of the role that I played when I was a barrister in helping define some of its basic principles of interpretation. And I think that now I've become president if every time there's a constitutional matter, I, I'm heard to pronounce on it, it will give the impression that I'm setting myself up as what well, some sort of rival Supreme Court. And, and I've, I've been very reluctant to, to do that for that reason, I think. The body that the Constitution has set up to be responsible for declaring the meaning of the Constitution, I, interpreting and enforcing it, is the Supreme Court, is the judiciary with the Supreme Court at its apex. And as a matter of good governance, it's better that that body, which has been given this exclusive power, is the one that is heard on constitutional issues. And that's the reason why I've not been uh, open or vocal on constitutional But I think this one, I, I, I feel strongly that I should make some comment. Firstly, the noise that was generated on this, at the time I was extremely surprised because as far as I'm, I can see it, and I think that the Supreme Court has confirmed it, the matters involved in this thing are open and shut. They're black and white. There can be no dispute about, ab about the issues that uh, the, the, the gentleman took to the Supreme Court. It is there for anybody who wants to see in Articles 102, Articles 104 of the Constitution makes it absolutely clear in black and white that the deputy speakers, I'm not speaking of the speaker, I mean the deputy speakers, when they're presiding, have the right to participate in the vote of the, of, of, of the Parliament. The whole structure of the Constitution, is, and indeed, and I believe that would have been part of the reasoning of the court, all the legislatures of the world, where the presiding person is a member of the legislature, like our deputy speakers are, like the Speaker of the House of Representatives in the, in, in the United States, or the President Pro Tem of the Senate in the United States, or the Speaker of the British Parliament. All of those have the right to speak because they are members of the Assembly. Our Speaker is expressly not a member of the Assembly. That's why he doesn't have the right to vote. In fact, he really ought not even to participate in the deliberations of the House. He's a referee, making sure that the debate is conducted properly and that the rules of procedure, or, uh, the orders of the House are, uh, are complied with. That's his role. But he ought, strictly speaking, not to be part of the proceedings of the House. That is not the case in the, in, in, with the deputy speakers. And that matter is transparent on the face of our Constitution. Indeed, even the presiding members of our district assemblies, they have the right to vote. Look at the district assembly law, because they are members of the assembly. And the, once you are a member of the assembly, you are representing certain uh, uh, constituencies. If you are denied the right to vote, it will mean to, it is tantamount to denying the right of the people you represent to have a say in the decision of the assembly. That would not be right. So I couldn't understand what all of this uh, uh, furore and controversy that was artificially generated. We're being told that um, the decision of the court amounts to judicial interference in the work of parliament. I'm not quite sure that the people who are saying this have actually taken the time to read the constitution of our country. It says so in black and white. The legislative power of parliament that is vested, of, uh, that is, uh, of the state which is vested in parliament, is subject to the provisions of the constitution. 
all organs of the Ghanaian state, including me as the head of the executive, we are all subject to the teachings of the Constitution. There's no, there's no body in the Ghanaian state that is above the fundamental law of the land. It would lead to uh, the very matter that we have striven so long to, uh, to avoid the concentration of power, of unregulated power in our state. We don't want that. We've had that experience before, and we brought about this constitution in order not to allow that to reoccur. So I'm astonished about how much public energy has been wasted, I would say so with the greatest self respect, been wasted in an, in an area, on an, an issue where there is so much clarity. And I'm happy that the court, and uh, I'm sure as you're aware, the, the Supreme Court, when it is declaring the meaning of the Constitution, and it does so unanimously, that is the most emphatic way in which the court can pronounce. And it is, a, I believe, a decision of seven of the judges in a unanimous decision declaring what the constitutional position is. I think we have an opportunity now to put this matter to rest and continue with the work of our parliament and the work of the ordering of our state. But as I say, um, I, I suspect that it is this peculiar position which we are with this very hair line uh, majority in, in the parliament that has given rise to all of these disputations and people making claims that are completely beyond the, 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 the teachings of the constitution and our understanding. But now that the Supreme Court has pronounced, I think what is required is for the nation, all of us, to, get, to, to put that matter behind us and to, do, and to do our work. To suggest that somehow or other, the parliament is beyond the scrutiny of the, of, of, of the Supreme Court when issues of interpretation of the, is to suggest that parliament is a law in itself. The whole principle of judicial review was developed by the judges, both in America and in England, to be able to check the activities of parliament. Indeed, in our own country, the first major constitutional case which had looked at the work of parliament was in the case to fall on the Attorney General, where the act of Parliament, the decision of the Parliament to uh, subject the then Chief Justice, the late Frederick Kwesi Apalu, to a vetting process in Parliament, had been expressly forbidden by the Constitution. And that is the reason why Dr. Marku Tufo, the late Dr. Marku Tufo, unfortunately, late, took the matter to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court made it quite clear that all the activities of all the institutions of our republic that impugn, that violate the Constitution are subject to the powers of the court and to the declarations of the court. Me, I want to repeat it, President, head of the executive, I am subject to the Constitution and to law. I cannot set myself above it. Everybody has his remit, but those remits are subject to the operations of the Constitution. And I'm happy that the Constitution has been so declared in such an emphatic manner by the Supreme Court. Let's support the Supreme Court to continue to do its work. And I'm hoping that I'll not have an occasion again to pronounce some constitutional <laughs> matters. Thank you, very much, Thank you very much indeed. Yeah.